Hey everybody, Teching here, and this episode, episode 45 of My Hero Academia, ends out the training camp arc. So before I get into the actual episode and do like a play-by-play -play what happened, I just want to talk about, like in retrospective, why this works. As a, as a story arc. Why this is not only one of the most powerful story arcs in My Hero Academia, but why in general this is just a good setup for a story, okay? Now, the basic premise is something that we've seen a million times in a bunch of different manga. You have an arc where your main characters are faced off against the main villains. That's it. It just happens to be, in this case, in this particular series, the villains are actually the League of Villains, but, you know. Okay, you have a bunch of different ways this can go down. Sometimes they can win, sometimes they can lose. In fact, they have to lose. In order for your manga to be taken seriously, in order for the story to feel real, you have to have times where your heroes lose. It just, it just has to happen. But there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. And, well, maybe not right and wrong, or, to, or not the right terminology. I think there's a, there's a lazy way to do it, and there's the, the, the way that takes a little bit more time, a little bit more writing, but the way that works better. The lazy way to do it, and I've seen this done before a bunch of times, and it might look cool when this is done, but that does not make it okay in every situation, alright? We have a scenario where... The villain team shows up, faces off against the heroes, and the villains just beat the shit out of the heroes. Like, the heroes have no chance. It's like, they throw everything they can do, and the villains just beat them into the ground. And then, the villains retreat, and it's like, you have no hope of defeating us. And then the villains, and then the heroes are on the ground like, oh no, we all got freaking curb stomped! There's nothing we can do! And then they get up, and then they go and they fight back. Okay, now look, I'm not saying that that is necessarily wrong, it's just that it's kind of lazy. I've seen that before. It's like, And I've seen it in situations where it's like, the villains immediately beat down the heroes, and then in the very next arc, the heroes just stand back up and they win. You know? I wonder what manga I'm using as a reference point here. I'm sure some of you could probably figure it out. But no, the thing about this arc, the training camp arc that I love, is that, yeah, the heroes do end up losing at the end of it. They end up losing Bakugo. Bakugo gets stolen away by Dobby and, and gets, you know, taken, captured by the villain association. I keep on saying villain association. I'm mixing up my one punch man here uh, by the League of Villains. That's a loss for them. All right, and we go into the ramifications of that in the bigger picture of, like, the news media and the reputation of UA and how all of this is kind of riding on the, the, the you know, uh, cap getting Bakugo back, you know? Um, but really, think about it. It's not a straight-up loss in that they just got beat to the ground. These kids fought tooth and nail. And some of them got taken out of the fight immediately by the gas, but some of them managed to fight back, and it really did feel like there's, you know, there's casualties on both sides. You know, it's not like the villains just showed up and they just won the day. No. No. O overall, it was a villain victory, but they, they had to work for it, you know? It wasn't like they just showed up, got away scot-free. So, I like that. I like how it works. And just, just the strife. You know, in the hands of a lesser writer, I feel like it would have been really easy to just, you know, you introduce Mr. Compress, and he steals away to uh, Tokoyami and Bakugo, and just skips out. And then all of the heroes are just like, DAMN IT! WE LOST HIM! But no, they have that one extra, like, we're not giving up, man, we're not giving up. We're gonna have our one final push to get him back, okay? And, uh, and, and in this episode, they do end up getting back Tokoyami. All right, so it does feel like no, no, you're not having a complete crushing, you know, victory over us. We're gonna, you know, at least get something back from you, and they did. So let's go into this. All right, so first off, before we even get to see what's going on with the uh, uh, Dobby and Twice and Izuku and Shoji and Todoroki, before we even get to that side, uh, we cut back to the lodge where uh, you have like Ida and Koda and, and Kirishima. They're all there. Um, Vlad King, the the homeroom teacher of Class B, is there protecting everybody until they get back. Um, so the lodge is sort of like their home base, kind of a safe area, but not really because. Dobby shows up and starts just he 
just, you know, burns a hole into the classroom and he's like, is like, hey, everybody. And he doesn't get very far because Vlad King just pounds him, body checks him into a damn wall immediately. Vlad King's quirk is blood control. So he spurts up. He has like one of those things, like an IV that goes from his arm up through his body. And I guess it's his blood that goes into like a tank and he can actually manipulate it, control it. Can actually come out of these little uh these little like vents in his gauntlet and the blood hardens and he can secure a, a villain to the wall so that was pretty badass and he has a line that's like you think you could just come in here into my classroom you know so that that was pretty neat uh we got to see the homeroom teacher of class 1b um but this Dobby states, um, it's a clone. It's the same thing that happened earlier with Aizawa. But he states, you know, like, uh, you reacted exactly how I expected you to react. Look, I'm just here to tell you that from here on out, everything's going to be different. Because there have been two major pillars that have supported this, this, this world now. You have UA. You have this institution that prides itself as one of the best schools in the entire world for raising new heroes. That is now shaken to the core. We've attacked you right where it hurts, and we're going to capture one of your freaking students. And then the other pillar is All Might, where we all know the situation with All Might. So he's like, these pillars are starting to shake, the eras are a-changing, and uh, we've kind of we've put that sense of doubt into the people. We've already won tonight. It doesn't matter. You can kill us, but... We've seriously hurt you. The media is going to find out about this. The world's going to find out about this. And on top of um, just damaging your reputation, that's probably going to end up, you know, more villains to our cause. So this clone Dobby basically just showed up to just mouth off and be like, we win, bitch. Even if you, even if you guys beat us, we still win. And then Aizawa shows up and just pounds him into the dirt, turns back into dirt because he's just one of Twice's doubles. I'm not sure how Twice's quirk works. If he actually like takes like dirt and transforms it into a clone or if he just like snaps his fingers and makes a clone. Uh, even in the manga, we, we found out a little bit more about Twice in the manga, but even in the manga, I don't know if it's been expressly shown how he actually physically creates a double. It might have been. But anyway, uh, now we cut back over to the, the scene there. So Izuku, Todoroki, and Shoji, they all crash down on Mr. Compress right in front of Dobby, right in front of Twice and uh, Toga. And they make no... Th there's no stalling here. Dobby immediately just like lights. He's like, Mr. Compress, get out of the way. And he's like, yep... So Mr. Compress, he can also compress himself, so he turns himself into a marble, so he kind of shrinks down out of harm's way, and Dobby just lights him up with his fire. They manage to get out of the way, except for Shoji. Shoji, half of his um, arms, which in a normal situation would be one arm, but in his situation it's three, they get burned. There's a, it's, it's a really funny scene in the English dub. If you've seen the English dub of that, it's this really kind of over-the-top, MY ARMS ARE BURNING! <laughs> Which I just found funny. I I mean, hey, I, I don't want to say it's over the top because if you just get lit on fire with blue fire nonetheless, I don't know if your reaction would be all cool and collected. Your reaction would probably be like, MY ARMS ARE ON FIRE! So, yeah, that was kind of funny. But anyway, yeah, um, they all get kind of, like, dispersed there because of Dobby's flames. Meanwhile, you have Twice in the background who's, whenever... Dobby is using his blue fire. Dobby is I mean, twice is like, that's so cool. And then when Todoroki uses his ice, he's like, that's so hot. So you got to love twice. Twice squares off against um, uh, uh, Todoroki. And he uses this kind of like, at first I thought it was like a wire, like a ribbon, but it kind of looks more of like a, uh, like a box cutter or something. Like he's got like a, um, he's got like a razor blade on his, but it's like in his bracelet that he just extends outwards. So it's like, a, I, I don't know, a malleable, bendable, kind of like razor blade thing. Like a really sharp tape measure or something. That's his main weapon. Seems effective because he was able to slice up Todoroki's ice pretty damn well with the damn thing. So that, that was pretty cool. Meanwhile, you have Toga. Who's going all freaky, Sundari, Yandari? Well, well, no, not really, not really so much Sundari. I'm more Yandari, I would definitely say, in the sense of she's like, oh, Izuku, I thought you were so cute, but you know what would be even cuter? If you bled a little more. So she goes to stab Izuku. Izuku, 
I mean, you gotta love the kid's gumption. That's a good word, right? Gumption. But he's both arms are broken. He's on the ground prostrate. Pro barely can even see out of one eye. This isn't the scenario for you, Deco, right? Um, Shoji shows up at the last minute, kind of pushes Toga away. This is where we start to see, like, a little bit of a... Because up to this point, Toga's been... She's been sadistic, but she's been, like, ha, 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 that kind of sadistic. This is the point where she's, like, I'm gonna kill you. That That's where she gets. So whenever she sees Shoji, she's like, you're not my type, but I'll kill you. You know, so that, that was pretty freaky. Um, now... At this point, Mr. Compress, he reappears as his normal body, and he goes up to Dobby, and he's like, are we ready to go? And Dobby's like, well, did you get the stuff? And he's, like, fiddling around in his pocket. He's like, yeah, Bakugo and Tokoyami, we got them. Now, at this time, Shoji actually grabbed both of the marbles out of Mr. Compress's right pocket, and he's like, ah, a man with six arms, I would expect no less from you. you gotta love Mr. Compress. So they're like, all right, let's bail, let's get out of here. So they try to get away, they run into a no Nomu in one side. The Nomu does not attack them, though, because remember, the Nomu is only trained to listen to the orders of Dobby, and Dobby just ordered it to come back to him. So they, they run into the Nomu in the woods, but it doesn't, like, break out its giant chainsaw and drill arms, like, Arr! you know, Frankenstein! No, it just kind of walks through the woods. And so, until Dobby gives it an order, it's not going to do anything. So, they're like, like, oh, shit, but we can't go that way. Let's go this way. That's when Kurogiri shows up, the warp gate dude, which is a massively useful OP quirk. They really need to, you know, if Kurogiri is just killed, that kind of ruins their entire operation plan. You know what I mean? Like, he's a very integral part of this. But anyway, he shows up and blocks their path, and then, then we find out it doesn't even matter anyway. Because it turns out Mr. Compress actually hid the real Tokoyami and uh, Bakugo in his mouth. And he kind of takes off his mask and we get to see a little bit of his face. But he's like, ah, do you get it? I am a magician after all. Just a little thing called misdirection. <laughs> Gotta love him. So he's like, yeah, the real ones are here in my mouth. And so they are about ready to go into the... Oh, and the other ones that uh, Shoji stole, Mr. Compress just compressed down some of Shoji's... Uh, not Shoji's, Shoto's ice. You know, and just made them, you know, the, into the Beyond Galls. Because he can make anything compressed with his marbles. It, it kind of takes them a long time to figure that out, too. Grant Granted, his quirk is a little weird. It, it takes them all a little while to figure out what his quirk is. Like, wait a second! You compress things down into marbles! And I was expecting him just to be like, Ah, it seems we have Captain Obvious here as the new hero. No shit! <laughs> you know, but okay, it's understandable. It's a weird quirk. You know, they, they, they've had a lot of stuff to deal with tonight. It's okay. Well, anyway, uh, they're about ready to go. And it's like, this is the moment where you think it's over. They failed. Uh, Aoyama, my man, Aoyama, he's hiding in the bushes the entire time. He realizes this is the, this is the last chance I'm going to get to do anything. He busts out his naval laser. I'm not going to show you my naval, but naval, oh, screw it. Naval laser. I was born without a belly button. Shut up. And he shoots that at the freaking villains and it hits some dead on freaking marksman skill with that. Hits Mr. Compress right in the mouth, knocks both of the marbles out, and then that's when all three of them, Shoji, to uh, Todoroki, and Izuku, all make a mad dash for them, because this is like last minute things, like they have to grab these things. Now Izuku can't really grab them because broken arms, and the pain from that seems to finally get him because Izuku immediately just like, Ugh! and he's like, just collapses on the ground. So it's just Shoji and Todoroki. Shoji reaches out, grabs one. Todoroki reaches out, and Dobby grabs it at the last minute. So he ends up grabbing the, the marble, and it, it appears, actually, that although Mr. Compress can compress pretty much anything down into his marble, he actually cannot tell which is which. Because after Shoji grabbed one and they had the other, they were unsure whether or not, like, which one was Bakugo. Because Bakugo was the main target. Tokoyami was just kind of a bonus. So they're like, the Dobby orders Mr. Compress, release your quirk. Because we have to be sure that the one we have is actually Bakugo. So Mr. Compress is like, yes, 
So he releases the quirk. Tokoyami was the one Shoji grabbed, so he's saved. And then Bakugo is the one that uh, was captured by uh, Dobby. So he grabs him by the neck. And remember, Dobby has a fire quirk, so he could just, you know, seriously injure slash kill Bakugo. And uh, they drag him into the warp gate and he gets captured. And so um, this leads into Izuku just breaking down and crying and blood on the ground. Um, they tried their best, and yet they still lost. They gave it every little, every ounce of strength they possibly had, but they, they still failed. They still la lost a classmate. Now, yeah, Izuku defeated Muscular. Um, Tokoyami defeated uh, Moonfish. And um, the Class B kids, uh, Testu, Testu, and Kendo, they defeated Mustard. So, like I said, it wasn't a complete loss for the heroes, but from Izuku's perspective, it was. Because Izuku looks up to All Might, and, you know, the whole idea, like, you gotta protect, you know, the people around you and all that stuff. And, obviously, it's Kachan, and he failed. He failed at the end of the day. So, and, and you remember, this has happened before with the slime villain all the way back at the first episode. Um, so, Izuku's probably really feeling the pain right now, but once again, how banged up he is, I would imagine, like, sh there's like a little, we, we skip a little bit a few days into the future after this. I would assume Izuku, right after this, he looks up and he sees all the, like, the forest on fire and he just freaks out. I would assume, like, right after that, like, it's either the adrenaline running off or the pain or just his trauma from the situation. He just passes the... He just passes out. He's done. He can't handle this anymore. Anymore, he would have a straight-up heart attack. Uh, kind of I'm surprised he didn't have a heart attack up to this point. But, um, we now get a brief... Uh, Izuku takes over as a narrator. Did you guys ever sit back and really think that this entire series is narrated by an older Izuku? Like, we're eventually going to cut to a point at the end of the series where Izuku is a grown-up adult, and he's, like, recording this as a documentary or something. But Izuku is the narrator, and he's like, yes, on this day we were defeated by the villains, and he goes over. We, um, we see the rescue workers. It's all very realistic. It's treated like a terrorist attack, which is basically what it was. You have planes flying over, releasing the, um... I don't know, Hayline or whatever it is, to put out the forest fire. You have EMTs, ambulances, police officers all over the freaking place. Um, you know, you have uh, the, the, the... Okay, here's how the roster shakes down. Out of the 40 students, 15 students were all knocked out by the gas. We know Hagakure and Jiro were, were part of that. Uh, several Class B students were part of that. Uh, Momo's got a freaking concussion. She gets out of it okay. Um, you know, uh, Uraraka and Suyu, they had some minor injuries. Like so, like Uraraka had a laceration on her arm, and Uraraka and Asuyu got her tongue cut a, a little bit, so they're not all too injured. Um, I think uh, there were like 20 students that were uninjured completely, and uh, he goes into the the pro heroes, Ragdoll and Pixie Bob. Pixie Bob also suffered a, a concussion; she got hit on the head pretty bad. They cannot find Ragdoll, and that was something I didn't mention in the last one. Uh, the Nomu from the last episode was carrying Ragdoll's cat ears, and they were all bloodied. I didn't even notice them. I didn't even, like, oh, that's what those things were? But yeah, Ragdoll was attacked by the tool arm Nomu. So, a lot of blood, and they don't know where she's at. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty scary there. We're, we're gonna find out what happened to her next arc, but, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm not even gonna say anything more after this, but, um, okay... Of course, the worst part of this whole thing is Bakugo is now captured, and this is very bad for UA, because a student that's training to become a hero has now been captured by the League of Villains, and if he becomes a villain, that's it for UA. It's over. They would not be able to operate as a school if one of their own students turns to the dark side and becomes a villain. Um, and they have this meeting. It's, um, it's the principal Nezu, it's Snipe, it's All Might's there, Midnight, and, um, uh, Present Mike. And they're all sitting around the table, and they're all talking about the events. And the thing that they bring up is that we've just gotten way too complacent. The problem is that the League of Villains was, because All Might has basically taken out a lot of villain organizations up to this point. If you wonder why the League of Villains is like the only real organization of, of villains that's working together, 
because there's always going to be villains that are just operating on their own, just out in the city, just causing trouble. But if you're wondering why in this super-powered world full of quirks, there's not, like, a bunch of different villain society, like the Guild of Calamitous Intent. Anybody get that reference? Please tell me you did. Um, by the way, new season this year, so I'm pumped for that. But anyway, um, there's not a lot of them because All Might crushed them all. And that's why he's known as the, the symbol of peace. But you had the, the, the League of Villains that, you know, um, Tomura is part of, and that's a little bit more powerful than they thought of. And so after the USJ attack, they thought, hey, we're going to hold the sports festival to show that we're, they're still strong. That was one of the worst things they could do because it showed off all the students, all their different personalities, which ones would be, you know, rife for the taking, Bakugo and his violent tendencies, and their quirks as well. So they're like, wow, we kind of dug our own grave on this one. And then we talk about how, you know, we tried to hold the training camp to train to fight against the villains, but the problem is, the villains were just way too ahead of us on this. They were ready to go. Like, we're trying to fix the symptom this, this is like going to the doctor about the flu when you're like six days into it. You know, it's just like, well, too late at that point. You're already, you know, it's already a problem, you know. So uh, they just, they try to have a remedy to the situation. The situation's already gotten too worse for that. Now, Present Mike brings up a, 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 a thing that they don't really want to hear, but they kind of have to. There's a traitor amongst UA. Now... Manga-only readers know that the traitor is, of course, Izuku. And I know that's going to come as a shock to a lot of anime. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. It's a fake spoiler just to mess with you. <laughs> just putting that in there like, oh, what? Huh? What? <laughs> no, no, no. We still don't know who the traitor is, if it's a teacher, if it's a student. I put my money. My money is on, prin on Principal Nezu. How great would that be? I'm just saying, because the sole reason that Principal Nezu's quirk is an extremely powerful one, high spec, which is like, he has higher intelligence than a human. If if he was, he could be a traitor, and, and he's more intelligent than a human, no one would ever find out. No one would ever know. And he's a really, he has a really kind of OP quirk, so. Watching you, little mouse bastard. But anyway, um... Present Mike brings this up, and all the other people at the table are just like, well, let's not start, you know, hanging people. Like, let's not start, you know, accusing everybody of being a traitor, because that's not good. Um, and also, we can't prove that you're not a traitor either. So, uh, we have a problem there. And Principal Nezu comes out and he says, well, at the very least, I trust everybody at this table. So, Present Mike, Snipe, All Might, Midnight. I, I, I trust all of you, but you cannot trust me because there's no way I can prove my innocence so it's a problem there is most like definitely a traitor we just don't know who it is yet um we find out from the police a bunch of things we find out Dobby was sighted a few days earlier they found the location of the bar so they're kind of piecing together where everything is there was the tracking device that Momo placed on the Nomu. She gives that to All Might. Uh, All Might talks to his friend in the police. I forget his name right now, but they all figure out they're, they're launching a counterattack. And they're, they're, everything's kind of planning out. Like, they have options here. It's not like they just, you know, they defeated us and we have no idea where they went. We seem to be piecing this together. You know, that's another thing I like about this manga. It's like, there's police and they actually do their job, you know? It's like, we're not just sitting on our hands here playing rescue. We actually, we're running an ongoing investigation. We have private detectives. We have people going around. We have undercover cops. We have, you know, eyewitness reports. We have people citing, oh, there was a guy with a patchwork face that went into this house over on 3rd Avenue. Okay, well, let's get a search warrant let's go in there into third out oh shit there's a secret bar in here oh the owner didn't know anything about it that's weird everything seems to be clicking together it's like yeah how it would work in real life so that's pretty cool um the episode ends with uh izuku being in his hospital room he wakes up he's been suffering from seizures and delirium for like the last few days the whole class gets together uh minus hagakure and jiro they're still knocked out from the gas uh momo has a concussion so she's in her own hospital room and obviously bakugo is um gone and so it's kirishima is the one that basically brings up you know we need to go rescue him and ida gets immediately on his case because of what happened with stain 
they acted without thinking they acted on you know the the whim of the situation they ended up getting a lot of trouble for that and Ida is the first person to say we have to trust the pros on this we cannot this is how Ida yells it's like we have to trust the pros on this we have to because he gets really pissed at Kirishima he's like I know what we want to do but this was the exact same thing that happened to me and we're, I'm not letting this happen I'm the class president damn it so they're like uh okay okay yeah but it's 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 not going to be the same as what what happened with stain we're not just going to go on a full frontal attack but we could still do something we could still save our friends so kirishima kind of reaches his hand out to deku kind of a dick move because deku's and look both of his arms are casted up but he's like he reaches his arm out to deku and he's like you still want you could still reach him right you could still reach bakugo deku right are you with me and that's where the episode ends so, um, the NIST is going to be leading into something known as the Hideout Raid arc. And, uh, it's not a very long arc. It's not very long compared to the other arcs, but, um... <sighs> Anime only watchers. This is the best arc of My Hero Academia so far. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. This arc, you will be jizzing in your pants by the end of it. You will be you you you'll be wondering like, oh my god, I didn't even know I had that much in me. It 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 is insane. All right, it's one of those short and sweet. Everything that you could possibly want is here. Okay, I'm not <coughs> to give you to give you. This isn't a spoiler. I guess it kind of is. It isn't. It isn't. It isn't. To just to sum it up, if I was going to make a movie poster of this, Hideout Radar, coming this summer, the tagline would be, pros being pros. That's all I'm going to say. It is amazing. So, um, get ready for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, um, I, I can't wait. I can't wait for the end of this. There's there's one scene in particular. Every manga reader knows exactly the scene I'm talking about. There's one scene that we're waiting for. <laughs> it's obviously the scene where Dizuku and, and Raka they go they go like square dancing. <laughs> that that's square dancing. To me. That's not even close. Okay. All right. All right. All right. But, um, and all told, this was a very powerful episode, a lot of stuff packed into this, a lot of realism stuff, the police doing their thing, the media, the news media, this is all over the world, this is a national, this is like, you know, how in our world, whenever there's a mass shooting or a terrorist attack, it's global news, this is that. A group of villains attacked a bunch of students, a high school students, in a training camp, and they kidnapped one of them. That would be a national freaking... That would be a global story. It would be huge. Right? So, yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, look forward to this next arc. Get ready, children. We're doing this. Teching 101, signing out. I'm pumped up. I gotta do it. Plus Ultra!